This is Big NAS. All 11 terabytes of video footage I've ever shot for this YouTube channel is on this thing. And this is Lil NAS. All that video is also on it? What's even cooler is the footage is replicated with ZFS from here to here. I back up this giant honkin' machine down to this tiny power sipping computer that I could take anywhere. Now, these are only two parts of a 3 2, one backup strategy, but I thought it's been a while and you deserve some updates. Like, what's going on with Retro Corner? And did I finally move the direct attach cable in the server closet? And what about that electronics workbench? I'll get to all that, but let's talk NASs first. For the big HL15 NAS, well, not much has happened to it. It's been running as my primary storage server since that knock to a fan swap a couple months ago. I've had zero issues, and it's pulling down almost exactly 100 watts 24-7, which is a little much, but it is running 32 cores, 6 hard drives, an HBA, and 128 gigs of RAM, so it's not too bad. Azeroth Rack released some new board firmware, so I'm going to update that soon, and we're going to do a massive NVMe upgrade later in the video, but I want to move on to the star of this show, this Lil Nas. See, I have a problem. I have this wonderful NAS storing all my data now, but unlike at home where I have two NASs sitting side by side, I don't have another NAS to back up the HL15 to. I mean, you can just ignore that 60 hard drive storinator sitting below it in the rack for now, mostly because when I turn it on, the lights dim and I can't hear anymore. For a backup NAS, I wanted something small, quiet, and sipping as few watts as possible. I mean, for a few weeks, I was just using this hard drive over here connected to my Linux test server. And that worked, but I had to remember to manually pull a backup every week, and I hadn't automated anything. This thing's running ZFS, that magical, wonderful thing all the other YouTubers keep raving about. This Linux test server takes like 5 minutes to boot, and it pulls down 40 watts while it's just sitting there idle. Can I do better? Well, after my ultimate Pi 5 NAS video, yeah, a lot. This little Pi has 32 terabytes of storage, and it only sips 8.5 watts at idle. And after a bunch of you asked about it, I tested this USB 3 2.5 gig adapter instead of that janky PCIe splitter. And it worked! I did a bunch more testing, and I actually get more bandwidth with this USB 3 adapter. Why is that? Well, the splitter downrated the bus to Gen 2. This USB adapter lets me stay at full Gen 3 speed for the hard drives, and I can get full USB 3 bus speed for Ethernet. In the real world, USB is a tiny bit slower than PCI Express for Ethernet, but the bandwidth that frees up on the PCI Express bus more than makes up for that. It might not be as fast as the HL15 for things like 4K video editing, but it is plenty fast for backups. And there are other options too, like I bought this 4 NVMe drive board for the Pi 5. It's even more compact. But NVMe drives are way more expensive once you get up to 8 terabytes, so for me, this thing's out of the question. Do you want to see a video on this thing? Let me know. Maybe I'll post something to my third channel. Go subscribe over there. And no, you don't even need a Raspberry Pi to get some massive power and space savings. There are some other cool boards like the CM3588 LTT covered. That board even has built-in 2.5 gig networking. But I have my Pi 5 and these SATA SSDs already, so I'm sticking with this build, at least until NVMe storage gets cheaper. So that means for this video, I had to get ZFS replication set up on here. Judging by how dismissive TrueNAS and Unraid are about building for ARM, you'd think it's hard to do it for a Raspberry Pi, but it's really not. Over on GitHub, I have my ARM NAS playbook that is an Ansible playbook and a README with some information about how to set up these NASs with the, the hardware lists, uh, the setup guides, everything. And I thought I'd quickly walk through the playbook. Uh, the, the thing that I was really interested in was could I take the exact same playbook that set up ZFS and Samba shares on the HL15, this big professional NAS, and make it work on the Raspberry Pi NAS, because that would be cool. And that's kind of how things are supposed to work in the world of, you know, once you abstract things out into Ansible, it should work on both. And good news, everything here worked exactly the same. I did not have to change anything in this playbook. I did add this in, uh, but all of these tasks for ZFS setup, this is all that's required on Debian 12 or Ubuntu. Um, these tasks were ex exactly the same. And the Samba tasks here to create the shares are exactly the same. Uh, I also added in this after my last video to make it so that Final Cut Pro allows me to open up projects off of the NAS without these fruit things and uh, Katia and Streams X Atra objects. Without these added to Samba, it won't work with Final Cut Pro. There's a few other weird things with Max and uh, Samba. 
I actually cover a little bit more of that in a blog post too. But anyway, all of this configuration is identical between the two. It's great. Um, and to configure that, I just have a couple different host fire files. And uh, to do that, I, I, I basically had the playbook set up just for the HL15, but then I split it up into the HL15 and the Raspberry Pi 5 setup. So HL15 is NAS01, Raspberry Pi 5, NAS02. But then now I can split up these host variables. So NAS01 has this uh, hard drive pool, and it has this share, and I have all the settings for them set up. Um, you'll notice that this is commented out. I actually removed those SSDs and put them into, into the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I will be redoing this, though. And then over on the Raspberry Pi, I have this, this pool and this Samba share. And you might see this little Sanoid thing, and you're like, what is Sanoid? Well, that's the thing that I added to make the Pi work for replication. The Pi will now uh, replicate everything that's on the main NAS, the HL15. And it uses a, a tool called Sanoid. Sanoid plus Syncoid help do that. Sanoid is a tool that creates ZFS snapshots on a schedule, which is nice. And then Syncoid synchronizes those snapshots from HL15 down to the Raspberry Pi 5. And this is the setup to make sure that they can see each other and communicate with each other correctly. Uh, this is the cron job that runs on the Raspberry Pi 5 that will pull all of the all the snapshots down. Anyway, this playbook is, this is Ansible, this is YAML, this is talking about ZFS and Sanoid and Syncoid. If you want, I could maybe do a deeper dive at some point on uh, my Level 2 Jeff channel. But for now, uh, I'll leave it at that. And if you want to explore that, go over to GitHub to my ARMNAS repository and read through it because it has all of my knowledge of ZFS and go into the issues and see the struggles I've had and uh, figure out, see, see how I figure things out and see if that helps you if you're building your own storage server. Using that configuration, even though the HL15 is on Ubuntu 20.04 and the Pi is on Debian 12, they're in perfect sync. Here's what Syncoid looked like the first time I ran it, copying down all 11 terabytes of data. Then here's what the Pi looks like today with all the snapshots replicated to it. The great thing about ZFS snapshots is that it only has to copy over the deltas, the data that actually changed. It's like Git. You don't have to have ZFS sit there like rsync and compare every single file and folder to make sure it gets all the changes. So very cool. And to make sure the Pi runs as stable as possible, even while it's booting off a microSD card, I flashed PyOS to an industrial microSD card, one that's rated for almost two petabytes written with 30,000 program erase cycles. Those specs mean this card can be used more like an SSD or hard drive, unlike cheaper microSD cards meant for storing pictures or videos. There's still no guarantees though, but that's why I'm using Ansible to set this thing up. If it fails, I can just flash a new card, reconfigure it, and it's back in service. But I'm also thinking about adding an RTC battery and having the Pi only wake up for backups. This would save about 10 bucks of electricity every year, at least at St. Louis power rates, and it would mean the backup is offline most of the day, which adds a tiny bit of protection against hacks or crypto lockers. But even with that, and even having a full on-site backup of my main NAS, it's only part of a good backup strategy. I did a whole video on my 321 backup strategy a couple years ago, and I still need another backup that's somewhere else. I haven't figured out that part yet, and I might just stick with Amazon Glacier Deep Archive because it's only about 10 bucks a month for 11 terabytes. That plus an R clone script would do fine. Or maybe I'll work with an undisclosed YouTuber on an undisclosed storage vault project later this year. Subscribe, and maybe we'll make that happen. But after running this thing for a month or so now, I have more thoughts on it. In the disadvantages column, it's not a server. It barely scrapes by at 2.5 gigabits, and even with that, it's a little kludgy because you either need a PCIe splitter or a USB adapter. And to keep it small and quiet, you need SSDs, and these things somehow are getting more expensive again. Hard drives are where it's at for value still. For advantages, though, this thing is tiny, and it only takes seven seconds to boot, which is a huge win for home use. The HL15 takes like five minutes. It also sips 8.5 watts at idle versus the HL15 at 100 watts. Sure, this will eat the pie for lunch in terms of performance, but if you don't need that performance, that 100 watts means you're burning through 114 bucks of electricity every year. The pie is only using about 10 bucks. If you need the power of a big NAS, get a big NAS. If you can live with Lil NAS, you'll end up saving a good chunk of change in electricity. And those prices are my cheap St. Louis rates, 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Looking over in Europe, rates are like 30 cents. 
So instead of 10 bucks versus 114 bucks, you're talking 22 versus 260 bucks a year. Anyway, the last major roadblock I have for permanent deployment is a case. And Radsa just posted a printable design. You wanna see me print it? Well, maybe I can do that and make another video on it on my third channel, Level 2 Jeff. And if I talk about this quad NVMe board on that channel, I'll also give you some reasons why I still think this SATA build is better for the Pi 5. Now, speaking of NVMe, Kyoxia sent me two of their ridiculously fast U.2 NVMe SSDs, these CD8s. What's so special about these drives? Well, Wendell can tell you all the details on level one techs, but these things can do a million read IOPS per drive with enterprise level write endurance, all with 15 terabytes per drive. They're beasts. But each drive needs four lanes of PCIe Gen 4, meaning you need CPUs with tons of PCIe lanes. And luckily, the Ampere Ultra that's in here has that in spades. If I tried it on the Pi, you'd see more bottlenecks than a Coke factory. I bought a slim SAS adapter for like 20 bucks, so I should just be able to jack these drives straight into the CPU. I wanna see if these things can saturate the bus on the server. So while I have this thing out and open, let's install the drives so I can start testing. 45 Drives actually publishes some 3D printable files, and uh, this is a modified version of that. I'll link to where I got this from. I forget who it was that uh, modified it for 15 millimeter drives. These are a little bit thicker than your standard. Um, typically your SATA SSDs will be seven or nine millimeters. These are 15 millimeter. Uh, so this is a modified standoff that screws in the back. Now, I actually talked to somebody else who was making one of these. I think he's one of my patrons, uh, and he designed this for his, uh, that clears the cooler on his machine. But on mine, I have this taller Noctua. It's a 3U or 4U compatible fan. And if I put this in here, it actually fits. But when the drives are in, the cables would be right, right in there. So that uh, didn't work out. But I like this design overall. And if your cooler is low profile, this would definitely work. And you could get four in there. The install was pretty easy, but I did hit a couple speed bumps. The heat set inserts I had on hand were a hair smaller than the ones 45 drives recommends. So instead of using a soldering iron to set them in using heat, I used super glue. And with the four screws holding them together, it, it seems pretty secure. Also on the HL15, it uses all the power connections from the RM750E power supply. So I bought a power splitter only to realize I had the genders reversed on the one I ordered. I was gonna use a Molex Y adapter, but didn't have one and I could have used a Molex to dual SATA to two SATA to Molex adapters. Somehow I actually do have all those, but you know what they say, Molex to SATA lose all your data. So for now, I just have one of these Molex plugs unplugged from the HL15's power distribution board. Hopefully that'll be fine since I'm only using six of the 15 drive bays in the front, but we'll see. But it wound up looking pretty good and I was careful to keep a generous bend radius on the slim SAS to U.2 cables I plugged from a header on the motherboard into the drives. That cable is 20 bucks on Amazon and I'll link to it below. I'm gonna test these hard drives out separately and I might make a short video about that on my third channel. So again, go subscribe over there. There's a lot of good stuff coming. But back to the office. I got a few of these air gradients installed. So now I'm tracking CO2 and air quality in the front, the studio and the rack room. It's cool to be able to see how the CO2 goes up when I'm recording with the doors closed and how quickly the levels go back down when I turn on the HVAC system. Since I know you'll ask, I have these air gradient monitors set up using ESP Home with my own custom config, which is up on GitHub. Air gradient's actually working on an official Home Assistant integration, so if you run Home Assistant, getting one of these set up should only take a couple minutes in the future. I've also been slowly making the workspace nicer as I'm working here, like I put in this overhead light for my equipment area and put in a remote controlled video light over the workbench. Oh, I forgot, you haven't seen yet. The electronics workbench is up and running now. I'll have more on it on Gearling Engineering soon, so also make sure you're subscribed there, especially if you haven't seen my dad making a hot dog talk with AM radio. Requires that, uh... And over in Retro Corner, I got these ridiculous little Apple Pro speakers for the Mirror Drive Door G4, and I say they're ridiculous mostly because Apple was peak proprietary back then. Even their speakers used a proprietary cable. They still sound good, but so do most other decent speakers from that same era. I also bought all the caps I need and some upgrades for this old Mac Classic, so I'll be restoring this thing sometime soon. I did pull the CMOS battery, luckily that hasn't leaked, and I'm planning on recapping the whole logic board now that I have the workbench set up. Also, a few moving vlogs ago, I mentioned I had a DAC to my rack and I'd patch that up. Well, I finally did. I mounted some cable raceways on the wall, then I realized I didn't have a cable long enough for the new run. I measured this cable to be about five meters and added a tiny bit more 
so I don't know if this will fit, uh, but hopefully it goes up here, across, over, and into that switch. And if it doesn't, I'll need to order another one. and it did reach with a couple loops of slack, so it ended up pretty nice. I patched it in and it lit up and my network was back in action. Could I have used fiber? Sure, but direct attach cables are cheaper and you don't even need any fiber optics that cost extra money and add a little bit to your switch's power draw. I also tweaked the settings on that Everything Presence One sensor Everything Smart Home sent me a few months back. It's detecting me a lot better now, but I still haven't mounted that up on the wall. Finally, after I finished building the Frigate NVR, which is now in the rack right here, I installed a new camera on the back of the building to watch my parking spaces. It's working great, and since I have animal detection on, I'm also seeing some birds, cats, and, well, it's spring, so even the geese are getting a little frisky around here. If you want to see that whole install, you know what I'm going to say. It's over on Level 2 Jeff. And what better way to end this vlog than with a new window decal to show the world that Gearling Engineering is tucked away in this little storefront in a strip mall in St. Louis. And yeah, thin vinyl decals are really annoying to install. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.